So welcome on this uh, masterclass about uh, dry needling. My name is uh, Barbara Kani. I'm uh, working full time at the Department of Rehabilitation, uh, Rehabilitation Sciences at Ghent University. And my main expertise is neck pain, but I have a specific interest in, uh, in dry needling. The foundation was laid by Dr. Jeanette Travell. She's an, she was an American physician and she was very inspired by the work of Keldren. Keldren was a British rheumatologist who injected muscles and ligaments with hypertonic salt to identify specific referred pain patterns. So uh, let's start with the underlying mechanisms and the pathophysiology of myofascial pain and trigger points. And I would like to start with a definition or with a quote, which is uh, typical for trigger points. It says, trigger points complicate injuries and other painful problems. They show up like party crashes. Whatever's wrong, you can count on them to make it worse. And in many cases, they actually begin to overshadow the orig original problem. And a few years ago, there was an important Delphi study where they asked a lot of experts about the diagnostic criteria of trigger points. So what criteria are for you very important during your clinical examination to identify a trigger point? And what is very important, we always talk about referred pain, but pain referral may include different sensory sensation. So not only pain, but also a dull ache, tingling, burning pain, and even tinnitus or dizziness can be a kind of referred sensation. There's a difference between active and latent trigger points. Active trigger points gives spontaneous pain at rest, movement, compression, whereas latent trigger points give only pain upon compression or movement. So what's the underlying mechanism of the, the, the origin of trigger points? There are a lot of hypotheses, but the hypothesis that is uh, nowadays most used is the integrated trigger point hypothesis, which was developed by uh, uh, Gerwin, Jan Dollerholt and Jay Shah. So on the left, right, uh, left hand side, you see an image of the original hypothesis. And what we have tried to do, we have made a kind of larger image to, uh, to make you understand how the development of a trigger point can uh, occur. But very often um, trigger points develop after as secondary to a, a primary source of, uh, of, um, of uh, nociception. If we look at the primary causes, the, the most important primary causes are muscle overload. This can be due to static or repetitive muscle contractions at low intensity. Think, for example, at office workers who work all day in a static position and where the trapezius muscle is continuously working at a static um, contraction at low intensity, but also eccentric and concentric muscle contractions very often related to, the, to a sports injury. So what they also identified that this increased uh, release of acetylcholine was associated with an increase in the spontaneous electrical activity of that muscle. And this is very specific to muscles where trigger points are, uh, are present. And this is what they also saw in uh, the study on the, on, the, on the rats. So what you see here is, uh, first you see the flat line, with, which is muscle fibers without a taut band. But then you see after a blunt striking injury and eight weeks of eccentric exercises in the left uh, hastrocnemius muscle, you see that in C, D and E, that there is increased spontaneous uh, uh, electrical activity. On the above, you see the cross sections and the longitudinal sections of um, uh, muscles where trigger points are uh, present. And on the uh, below, you see the images uh, of the control group. So and what's happening then? If the sarcomere is contracted, then this can give compression to the blood vessels that gives energy to the muscle on one hand, but due to the fact that the sarcomeres are contracted all the time, they ask a lot of energy. So the muscle receives less energy because there is compression of the vessels. 
And on the other hand, the muscle asks a lot of energy to per uh, persist that uh, sarcomere contracture. So this is important to understand what the effects of trend needling are. So understanding the underlying mechanisms of the development of a trigger point um, will give you insight in the neurophysiological effects of dry needling. So what I would like to do now, I would like to talk about the effects of dry needling and I will start with the neurophysiological effects of dry needling and then I will end with the clinical effects of uh, dry needling. I will not tell you all the analysis of or the results of all the analysis, but the main, the, the most important ones, what you see here in this image is that due to uh, dry needling after uh, at the location of a trigger point, we see that there is again a normalization of the acetylcholine. So what you can see here, we see due to the um, occurrence of a trigger point normally that there is increased release of acetylcholine and increased spontaneous electrical activity. And due to dry needling, we can again normalize the acetylcholine release and we can decrease uh, the spontaneous electrical activity. So we saw that after five days of dry needling, that we saw an increase in the number of hypoxic responsive proteins like TNF-alpha and so on. After, after five days of dry needling stimulation. And these higher levels were maintained five days after the five dosage treatment. So we saw this change in oxygenation immediately after five days of dry needling, but this also maintained and we still saw this change in oxygenation five days after five days of dry needling. So this brings me to the last part of my uh, presentation, which is about the clinical effects of dry needling. And what you see here on this figure is that dry needling is mainly, and I think in 90 or 95% of the cases, used for musculoskeletal disorders and used to um, treat the trigger points. But nowadays, it's more and more also used for other uh, disorders like neurological disorders and also for uh, scar tissue. Yes. Then we see that the last couple of years, there have been a lot of systematic reviews that have looked at the clinical effects of dry needling and musculoskeletal disorders. And we have uh, looked at the quality of those systematic reviews and we have tried to make an overview of all those systematic reviews. So what However, if we look at specific body regions, then we see that mainly for the neck, the shoulder and the temporomandibular joint, that there is some more evidence. And one of the reasons is that those reason, re, uh, regions are investigated uh, more than other regions uh, of the body. A second clinical effect is in patients with neurological disorders. This is, uh, these are studies that have mainly been done in um, Italy, in Spain, in uh, other countries. This is not used that uh, much. And the clinical effects of dry needling and neurological disorders are described as improving spasticity. And it may also stimulate mechanoreceptors and nociceptors in the skin and the underlying tissue, uh, which may also improve tissue mobility, pliability, but also reduce hyperalgesia and allodynia. Because very often with scar tissue, you see a lot of pain, uh, local pain in that scar tissue. So it's also um, hypothesized that trinilin can have uh, an effect on, on that pain by reducing hyperalgesia. But it can also be used for neurological disorders and in the treatment of scar tissue. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation.